Good morning, friends. Welcome to the house of the Lord for worship. We gather as one people. We worship as one body. We ask the Lord to heal our broken hearts and bind up our wounds, that we may come into the presence of God healthy and whole as we seek wisdom as we seek discernment of God's greatness, as we honor the power and glory of God's love. Let us prepare ourselves, our hearts for our worship. Good morning. If there's anyone that has some joys or some, some serious things that they want to tell about, um, please come forward and do that. We have an announcement. Um, gentleman, John Anthony, that some of you may remember, passed away on Friday. Um, he will be buried from the Becker Funeral Home on Market Street sometime during this next week. He was a good guy. He, he did a lot of things for the church. Good morning, friends. I'd like to welcome each and everyone warmly this morning to our morning worship. It is my joy to welcome um, two members of my extended family, Robin and Corey, visiting from Columbus. Welcome, both. Please stand for the call to worship. How wonderful it is to sing our praises to God. God's mercy is given generously to all in need. Come, worship and celebrate God God is reaching out to you this day.
please join me with the prayer. Powerful God, from the very beginning, you blessed creation. You have loved and shielded your people through all the joys and trials of life. We come to you this day, rejoicing in the many blessings you have given to us. We open our hearts again to hear your word for us and to gather strength and joy for service in your world. Be with us and bless us again, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. May our ushers come forward for our tithes and offerings for the work of God in this church and community. God of grace and mercy, you are the source of true healing that can make us whole. We remember this morning that Jesus' ministry was deeply involved in both healing of people's bodies and healing of relationships. As we take time now in worship to offer our gifts to you, we pray that they might be used to bring healing of body, of spirit, and of broken relationships to people who are in desperate need. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Please stand for the gospel reading if you are able. This morning it comes from Mark, the first chapter of 29 through 39 ver <coughs> verses. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone's looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. 
That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. seated. Let us pray. Lord, speak to me that I may speak. Open our ears, our minds, and our hearts to receive your word. Holy Spirit, illumine us. Amen. In our gospel reading this morning, we witness the unfolding of Christ's ministry marked by compassion, authority, and a profound sense of purpose. Following Jesus' baptism and a period of solitude in the wilderness, Jesus begins his journey in Galilee where he calls upon four fishermen to join him on a transformative mission. You recall the call to discipleship two weeks ago of those four, four fishermen. So these fishermen were called to join Jesus on that transformative mission. So together they arrive in Capernaum a fishing, a humble fishing village nestled by the Sea of Galilee. On the Sabbath day, Jesus enters the synagogue teaching with a remarkable authority that astounds those who gathered, the congregation, those who gathered. And amidst the sanctity of the synagogue, 
a man possessed by a demon confronts Jesus, recognizing him as the one, the holy one of God. With a mere command, Jesus silences the unclean spirit affirming his divine identity and power over evil. Leaving the synagogue, Jesus and his disciples enter the home of Simon, Peter, and Andrew, where they encounter a poignant scene of familial care. Simon's mother-in-law lies ill with a fever, a concern immediately brought to Jesus' attention. In a moment of silent authority, Jesus takes her hand, dispelling her fever and restoring her to health. Her response is immediate. She rises and begins to serve, embodying the essence of discipleship, a life of service rooted in love and gratitude. As evening descends, the news of Jesus' miraculous deeds spreads like wildfire through Capernaum. A throng of the sick and demon-possessed gathers at Simon's door, seeking solace and healing from the one who embodies God's love and grace. Mark's gospel highlights the distinction between healing and exorcism illustrating Jesus' intimate connection with those in need. Jesus' touch becomes a conduit for divine grace, a tangible expression of God's closeness to humanity. How many of us have experienced that healing grace and touch of Jesus? And we are still longing and seeking after that healing touch. Jesus, in his humanity, understands the depths of human longing and suffering. He retreats to a deserted place, enveloped by darkness to commune with the Father in prayer. Isn't that what we do when we pray as individuals, as prayer warriors? We take it seriously to pray for those in need, and we are all in need as children of God. This pattern of solitude and communion with God marks pivotal moments in Jesus' ministry, underscoring the importance of spiritual intimacy amidst life's trials and tribulations. In the wilderness, Jesus confronts temptation and seeks divine guidance echoing the profound journey of faith we will undertake. As we delve deeper into the gospel narrative, we encounter Jesus navigating the intricacies of solitude, a darkness that becomes the canvas for profound moments of connection with the divine. Following the miraculous multiplication of loaves and fish, 
an event often referred to as the miracle of multiplication. Jesus sends his disciples away on a boat and retreats to spend the night in prayer. In a poignant parallel, we find Jesus in another garden on a different night wrestling with the weight of his impending sacrifice. In the solitude of the garden, Jesus utters a prayer that echoes through the ages. He says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet, not my will, but yours be done. How many times this resonates with us when the tough is going. We're going through so many challenges, so many difficulties in our lives, and we sometimes pray, may this cup pass away from us. Even Jesus, at the outset of his ministry, faced the challenge of discerning his purpose. And I hope, it is my hope, that we constantly look into ourselves, praying and discerning our purpose in this journey of life. Jesus did that. He found clarity through prayer. A practice that became a cornerstone of his life and mission. Despite the inherent risk of being alone in the dark wilderness of first century Palestine, devoid of modern conveniences, Jesus sought solitude for one-on-one -on -one communion with his Father. Yet, even in the solitude, interruptions occurred. Simon and his companions sought out Jesus, proclaiming, everyone is searching for you. In response, Jesus unveils a surprising plan, a plan that challenges a disciple's expectations. Rather than remaining in the familiar territory of Capernaum, where he could continue the pattern of healing and casting demons, casting them out, Jesus declares, let us go on to the neighboring villages and towns so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came out to do. The disciples faced a moment of decision, a recurring theme in their journey, and one that mirrors or daily choices. This pivotal moment echoes Jesus' timeless message. Repent. Turn away from old ways. We can't be the same. We can't remain the same. And believe that the kingdom of God is here now. The call is clear, my friends. Be changed. Be transformed and discover your purpose, resolving to live it out. Jesus, in his ministry, exemplified that purpose transcends local healing. It encompasses reaching as many people as possible we can just sit in the pews 
and not reaching out and inviting and welcoming all people. So that message encompasses reaching out. I said that already. As many as possible with the profound message of God's love, mercy, and grace. Contrary to the notion that Jesus actively sought out people to heal, his primary mission was to respond to those who came seeking his touch and help. Some believed, repented, and their lives were forever changed. Reflecting the transformative power of encountering Jesus Christ, these individuals responded with gratitude by serving a profound demonstration of discipleship. The disciples learned a crucial lesson. True discipleship requires more than passive observance. Like Simon's mother-in-law who rose and served, genuine followers of Jesus must actively engaged in the work of the kingdom of God. In doing so, we become the embodiment of Christ for those we encounter. We may not solely address urgent physical needs, but we hold the unique role of welcoming others into the family of God, helping them recognize their need for a Savior, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The narrative emphasizes that we are not merely instruments of physical relief, but conduits of transformation through our daily disciplines of prayer, Bible study, service, and sacrifice. We should mirror the transformative journey into Christ's image, Christ's likeness. Each day presents to us an opportunity to decide to keep following Jesus, actively embodying his love for others. In the pursuit of purpose, Jesus' example teaches us to draw close closer and closer to God. The metaphorical dark wilderness of solitude becomes the sacred space where we meet God and confront our fears face to face. We really would have fears, fear of the unknown, Fears of uncertainty. It is in this profound encounter with God that we find purpose and learn to rely, to trust completely in God's will. For we remember that we are no longer our own, but God's. Not just saying it, but living it. 
While the disciples might have preferred Jesus to remain in the familiar landscape of Capernaum, Jesus leads them into their own dark wilderness. The uncharted territory of introducing others to the kingdom of God and leading them to repentance. In the relentless pursuit of purpose, Jesus faced the challenge of balancing the immediate needs of those around him with the overarching mission set by his heavenly Father. The disciples, searching for Jesus, declared, everyone is looking for you. The demand on Jesus was overwhelming. Everyone wanted a piece of him. Yet, Jesus understood the necessity of prioritizing his primary purpose, even if it meant disappointing the people of Capernaum. A commentator aptly noted that people rarely Come knocking on your door to help you achieve your purpose. Often, they are more inclined to enlist your assistance in completing their priorities rather than contributing to your topmost goal. The disciples, too, fell into that pattern. Observing the multitude from Capernaum, seeking healing and exorcism, they failed to pause and consider Jesus' primary priority. While it would have been easy for Jesus to immerse himself in the healing miracle spectacle due to his compassion, he steadfastly focused on God the Father, his Father's directive. To proclaim the good news that God's kingdom had broken into the world. The call to silence the demons resonates profoundly. Jesus invites us to confront the internal struggles that haunt us, our worries, our persistent sins, our nagging voices questioning our worth, inacceptance, whether it's the feeling of not being good, rich, smart, thin enough, all the things that come to our minds all the time. Jesus came to cast out these demons, to cast these demons out of our lives permanently. The demons that taunt us with declarations of our unworthiness, are the very demons that Christ intends to silence. My friends, the invitation is clear. Let Jesus silence the demons, freeing us to fulfill our purpose as followers of Jesus Christ. The narrative pivots to a crucial principle to keep learning, to keep growing, 
to practice the smile even that we have shrunk. We can still grow together by not our strength, by our strength of being together. Don't divide. Stay together. Work together. Let the Holy Spirit move you into God's purpose for this church, for God's kingdom. Think about your purpose and the fulfillment of Christ's love and mission for this church and community and the world. The narrative, I repeat, pivots to that very crucial principle. And the Gospel of Mark frames the story in a deliberate sequence from a single exorcism in the synagogue to a healing act in a private home eventually expanding to a larger scale as Jesus ministers to the many at Simon's door. This framing underscores the importance of continuing our work together, even small scale, before we progress and aspire to a larger scale impact. An illustration from contemporary church history emphasizes this point. The largest megachurch in America began with a humble gathering of a dozen people in a two-door, two-car garage. The essence of this principle is clear, and we are fortunate to have this space. So we need to develop our gifts and certainly our understanding of God's purpose for us. It allows us the opportunity to refine our understanding and develop the ministry that we have all been given. As we seek to discern our purpose, the plea to continue to learn, to be humble, to practice the small, to multiply, to scale. The plea invites us all to embark, to continue on this journey of gradual growth, even if we have to start all over. Just as Jesus moved from the intimacy of a private home to a public space, we too can transition from learning new ways, small beginnings, continuation to broader impact. This approach aligns with the wisdom of seeking God's plan. Intricately, woven before time began. Approaching Christ's table, we find an invitation to draw close to him. As Pastor Bruce reminded me this morning, the whole service for today is about communion, always communion with Christ. So all the parts are not disjointed. We come together as the body of Christ. So as we approach Christ's table, we are invited to draw closer to him. 
prioritizing God's desires over the clamor of others. Jesus himself extends his offer to help us silence, silence the demons hindering us from living out our purpose. Moreover, Jesus encourages us to commence and continue our journey gradually. With one person he places in front of us each day who needs to know Jesus. For that per person, we might be the only Jesus they will ever meet. And his words resonate, begin where you are, continue, keep on keeping on in the journey. Don't forget your neighbors, your friends, your family, the stranger, everyone, regardless of where they come from, regardless of how they speak, regardless of their status quo. No conditions. Stay with them. Walk with them. They need you. Stay with the ones that Jesus places, the ones that Jesus places on your path. They need to know Jesus. For those persons, we might be the only Jesus that they will ever meet. So friends, we step forward, not as saviors. We cannot be saviors, but we can be and should be the vessels. We should be humble vessels. We should carry the light of grace, the warmth of compassion, the fragrance of love. Our mission unfolds in small acts, a listening ear, you know all of that, a kind word, a helping hand, a supportive presence, Hold the people next to you, hold their hands. In these seemingly ordinary moments, we embody Christ's presence. So as we will break bread together, we remember that this table is not exclusive. It is open to all people, the broken, the weary, the doubting. They too are invited and are welcome. For Christ's love knows no bounds, and Christ's grace extends beyond all human comprehension. So let us partake, not dressed of bread and wine, but of the divine invitation. Let us be Christ to the world, one encounter at a time, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The altar is open for prayer. Anyone in need of prayer may come forward. If not, if you need prayer and want to stay in your seat, that's okay too. Lift up your hearts to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray.
holy God. How majestic is your name in all the earth. We are in awe of your creation. We contemplate every day the wonders of your creation. Your love, your goodness and mercy abound in our lives each and every day. So we are gathered here under the shelter of your wings. We continue to be nurtured by your love. And we are encouraged to fly by faith on the wing of your spirit. So we thank you and praise you. We are concerned every day by so many reports of the trouble happenings in our world where war and strife seem to be the order of the day and we are caught up we are caught up in the midst of this chaos we ask you Jesus to calm our spirit to calm our anxieties and our doubts to calm our fear of the unknown and uncertainties help us to focus on the love you have given to, not, to us in Jesus Christ. Help us to be restored, for we know that you can restore us as your body. Remind us, O oh God, that your mercies extend to us this day as they extended for the people, to the people of long ago. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. So as we have heard your word to be forgiven and healed, to find ways to serve you more in peace, Help us to offer healing and grace to those who are hurting, those who are fearing and facing hurt by racial violence and injustice, those impacted by violence of war, those in, who have lost their lives. We pray for their families in Gaza in the Middle East, everywhere, even in my own country, Haiti, we lift them up to you, O oh God. Living God, your love for us is unfathomable. So open our ears to hear the cries of your neediest children, O oh God. May your love for us prevail. May our eyes be open to see how we can offer kindness and love to humanity. Open our eyes to think about compassion in all circumstances. Heal our spirits and our wounds, our souls. Heal us, Lord. Cast out from us the demons of arrogance and injustice and indifference and apathy as we embrace the new life that is offered to us in Jesus Christ. We offer prayers of healing for those in dementia, their caregivers. We lift up to you those near and far in our community in your kingdom in the whole world 
who are suffering, who have sickness, addictions, traumas, crisis of all kinds. We thank you for the healing and grace experienced by our own people in your community, in this church, day by day. May we not be discouraged. May we continue to hold on your hand. Walk with us as we be in love and grace with one another, oh God. For you are Christ, our healer, our redeemer. Hear the cries of our hearts, we pray, oh God. Help us to know and accept that healing grace and favor that we may rise up and minister among your people. Help us go forth showing your love to all who search for you. Speak through us that our lives and our words may proclaim your good news. For it is the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior and Redeemer and Sustainer, that we pray. Amen. I would like to invite Pastor Bruce to join me as we celebrate the sacrament of the Holy Communion. We begin with the invitation, of course, for the sacrament of Holy Communion. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in love, to seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. And join with me then in praying the confession prayer and we'll have the pardon follow me. Let us pray together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory be to God. Amen. Would we now take a moment to greet one another and share the peace? Let, we, let, let us offer one another signs of peace and reconciliation. Peace be with you. Blessings. Oops.
The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven and all, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy. God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of Holy your glory. It's on in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's on in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your, name, your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of the suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. In the night in which he, was, he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, he gave thanks to you, and he broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice, in union with Christ's offering for us, as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died, Christ, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. For out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom, thy kingdom come, come. Thy, thy will, will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup of salvation which we bless is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we share in the one loaf and partake of the same drink. The table is ready. Our ushers will invite us to come forward for communion.
Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, that you have fed us in this sacrament, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet prepared for all humankind. Amen. messengers of peace, grace, and love. Go now into the world rejoicing in God's presence with you. Bring the news of peace and hope to all you meet. Amen. Amen.